So who exactly is receiving this income? So again, let's start in 1990. And in that year, by far, the answer would have been the United States, the United Kingdom. Going forward in time, the relative share of the US falls as other income countries' shares rise. The UK share rises for a while and then begins to really diminish and disappear for a while. Other countries, on the other hand, have their shares rise. So you should be able to see on the graph, the Netherlands, France, notice in particular Japan share of their multinationals of foreign income, also Germany, and a little bit on top Luxembourg. And we'll talk a little bit about Luxembourg. Okay? So we can take the data and construct a very basic index. That's a concentration index. And this is something you may have seen in other contexts, for example, in industrial organization, when we look at the market share of the largest producers. So in this context, if there was one country receiving all of the income, the index would be 10,000. So instead we started 6,000 in 1990 and it begins to come down. And so by 2000, 2005, it's come down. And again, in the last decade, it seems to have stabilized. So there is a concentration among a few large countries who are receiving roughly 90% of all the FDI income that's generated. And up to now, that distribution has been relatively constant. Again, not quite sure what's gonna happen in the future. Why? Why does the US have such a large share of the income? And there certainly are different reasons. FDI was a large component of US capital flows, even before 1914, when US firms were expanding into South America. And then again, after 1950. So historically, it's not a surprise to see the US receiving income from FDI. Moreover, as many of you probably know, the return on US FDI assets is greater than the return on US FDI liabilities. And there certainly has been a literature generated trying to figure that out. At least part of the answer is number three, the fact that U.S. multinationals shift their foreign profits to low tax financial centers. So U.S. firms are very good at figuring out which countries would give them the most profits post-tax. I want to point out, however, it's not just U.S. multinationals that do that. Other countries have multinationals that are also active in minimizing taxes. And I'm thinking in particular of France and Germany. So this is not a unique U.S. phenomenon. So up to now, this may have looked fairly straightforward, so I guess it's time to complicate it. As many of you know, there are indeed units of multinationals called special purpose entities. And these are indeed a unit of a multinational that's controlled by the parent. And they are located in a country where their core business basically is to channel funds among the other units. They have few employees, little or no physical presence in the host economy. Almost all their assets and liabilities are investments in or from other countries. Why are they there? Because they allow the multinational to minimize taxes and perhaps to avoid some regulations. So these have become very widespread and this is well known within the IMF as well as other institutions about the spread of the SVEs. Among the problems that can cause us is that it can exaggerate the true size of FDI. What may look like FDI flow say from the US to perhaps the Netherlands and then a different FDI flow from the Netherlands to a third country is in fact the same amount of money but it's being double counted. So the OECD has been asking its members to differentiate between SBE and non-SBE activities since 2005. And compliance has been patchy. Not all countries have been doing that. Some countries claim they don't have any SBE activity. So we don't have the data we would like to really make a comparison. The data you've seen up to this point that I've showed you was from the IMF itself. And so it is possible to take the data we have, which luckily does include Luxembourg, it does include the Netherlands. And to look at my index and recalculate it for 2005 onwards using the OECD data. And as you can see, generally it's higher, which makes sense because I can tell you that if you use the OECD data, the non SBE data, Luxembourg share literally disappears. There is no more income received by Luxembourg. And the Netherlands share falls. They still have some because they do have multinational there. But to the extent that there's other income, that will fall. That means that the concentration ratio should rise, as you can see. And so the countries that are left, i.e. the US, the France, Japan, Germany, they will become, in a sense, even more important because they are, if you like, the ultimate recipients of that income. Okay. So finally, a last set of slides coming up. I'm going to differentiate between advanced countries, and there you have a, a group of them, no surprises there, and some financial centers. Again, I don't think any surprise when you see the list of countries. And what I want to do is to show you for each group of countries the difference between the FDI equity income I mentioned at the beginning and the interest income. So let's start with the advanced economies. 
Now, this is FDI income as a percent of domestic GDP. And looking at it, I think you can see right away, trend's pretty straightforward, that these countries receive more and more equity income. Again, equity income is based on the business activities of the firms up to around 2011. Then it's fallen a bit since then, the last couple of years. That's positive. Notice though on the interest income. So these countries have deficits on the interest income i.e. they're paying out to other units of their multinationals some amount of interest income. So where might that interest income be, be going to? And of course, the answer would be the financial centers. So you'll see the mirror image. The financial centers are receiving interest income that really took off starting around the year 2000, right? and then fell a bit at the time of the financial crisis, perhaps not surprisingly, rose again and has been going up and down since then. So these countries are receiving money from multinationals but not from business activities, as much as from interest income being received from the units that are making the money. Conversely, their equity income has a negative number. And I can tell you most of that is Ireland. That to the extent that Ireland does have firms there manufacturing, the income that's being generated is earned by usually the US-based multinationals that own them. So that's why they have the flip. So one point before we go any further is that I hope I've convinced you that it makes a point. Uh, it's, it's worthwhile making the point that there is a difference between equity income and interest income, and that you may want to compare the behavior of the advanced economies with the behavior of the financial centers. So we're gonna see that. So now that I've actually convinced you of that, we can raise the question, well, does all this income affect domestic income inequality? And so I would say that, well, if we ask the following question in another context, do remittances affect inequality in their home countries? It's perfectly logical to say, well, does FDI income affect domestic income inequality? They're both, if you like, factor payments, one on labor, the other on capital. There is a literature on remittances and income inequality that, again, you'll hear about later on today. And so I'm raising, if you like, the question, but not on labor income, but on capital income. And I'm going to make the argument that it could happen. FDI income can increase inequality. Two reasons that I could think of. First would simply be the fact that the public ownership, the stock ownership of multinationals, is highly concentrated. And those figures, if you don't know them in the US, for example, the top 1% of the wealth distribution on something like 34% of all the stock. So right away, there's a high degree of concentration there. Second of all, the CEOs of the multinationals are compensated for earnings performance. And we know that in terms of labor income, that the distribution there has been rising at the top, that these people are better and better paid over time. So those are reasons why we might think it's valid to think that in fact, the FDI income would indeed affect income distribution. So we ran some empirical analysis looking at the share of national income held by the top 1% of households. The primary variable of interest for me was the FDI income when I divided it into the equity, the interest, and the total. Then control variable is taken from the literature that I found about this issue of inequality. We have data for 17 advanced economies, six financial centers, 1990 to 2018. I have fixed country and time effects in robust areas. And as you can well imagine, there's lots of results. I really am going to key on just a few, given the time constraint. So the dependent variable, again, is the income share of the top 1% of the income distribution. And it's the impact upon their income of, in the first two columns, net FDI equity income scaled by domestic GDP. And you can see in both cases, it's positive, significant. A 1% change in the FDI income scaled by GDP leads to a 0.2% in the income share of that top 1%. Look at the middle two columns and you'll see a different dynamic. Now the interest income is not significant at all. Again, that shouldn't surprise us having looked at the graphs for how income is generated for the advanced economies. When we put it together and look at all FDI income, we see that FDI income overall has a highly positive and significant coefficient. And now we know why. It's because of the equity income, obviously not the interest income. So that's an interesting result, I would claim. And we can keep going to say, all right, we know something about FDI income, but we saw earlier there are other forms of foreign income. Maybe they're important too. So in the first column, I show the coefficient associated with replacing equity income with net portfolio income. It's positive at 10%. Doesn't always stand up when I do robustness checks. Net other income has no significant coefficient. And then when you look at the total net investment income, it is indeed positive. And I think we can now say it must be because of the investment for FDI income. Similarly, when we look at net primary income, that's also positive. 
And again, thinking about what goes into it, the source should be the FDI income. And finally, we look at the current account overall, and we can see a positive significant, a positive coefficient with the current account, which clearly reflects a number of things in the current account, but I would claim the FDI income. So that's the data that I have to date for the advanced economies using the IMF data. Suppose I switch to my financial centers. Interesting results. FDI income, equity income in the first two columns, again, is significant. By the way, the difference between the columns are simply the control variables in the paper. So those results are very similar. Notice now, however, in the middle two columns, when we switch to the interest income, there actually is a negative coefficient. So clearly these interest payments are not benefiting the top 1% within the financial centers themselves, which I think makes sense. They're simply located there to take advantage of the taxes. And finally, at the end, if we aggregate FDI income, we get a positive coefficient in one case and not the other. And when you look at what's behind it in the first four columns, you can see why. Obviously, these things could cancel themselves out. When you go on to the other types of investment income, portfolio, other, no results in the sense of nothing significant. Similarly, net investment, at primary current account. To be fair, again, the number of countries is smaller than we had with the advanced economies. That may have something to do with the econometric results. But it may also simply be that FDI income is very different in the role it plays within these economies. So those are the main results I simply want to bring to your attention. Let me emphasize this is work in progress, number one. So any comments coming in email or phone calls would be appreciated. Number two, I realize that there are people at the funds who know the data much better than I do. So again, any suggestions about anything I may have misinterpreted, uh, I'd appreciate them getting that from you. Okay. I have other results to date. I use the OECD non-SVE data where available and basically get pretty similar results. Not a surprise because there aren't that many countries with SVE data. I use the 10% income share as my dependent variable, come up with pretty similar results. So that seems to hold up. And I also use price winston regressions with panel corrupted standard errors to account for some of the econometric issues that show up when you do this type of regression. So those are among the things I've done to date. And here's what I think it tells me. The diffusion of FDI income so far has been concentrated among a few advanced economies. In those countries, the FDI income consists primarily of equity income, while financial centers are benefiting from interest income. The top tiers of the income distribution in those countries are benefiting from the FD, FDI equity profits. I think that's clear. And therefore, FDI income in general can be said to increase inequality both among and within countries. So that's what I've come up with today. I did want to mention a few articles very quickly before I finish. If you become, I hope, interested in the whole overall issue of the current account and the role of net primary income, Kristen Forbes and two co-authors at the Bank of England have an article in the Economic Journal of 2017 that talks about the general phenomenon, which is very good, very clear, really kind of lays out what's been happening. There is another paper that looks at FDI portfolio income on income shares that appeared in the Journal of Policy Modeling in 2016. And I have a paper that looks at the flip side, where the money is coming from. And the answer is from emerging market economies. And I have an article about that phenomenon within those economies, and that should be appearing sometime this year in the Review of International Economics. So that's what I have. Again, happy to answer any questions now, but we look forward to having longer conversations later on at some point on Zoom, the phone, whatever would work. Thanks very much, Joe. That was great. Um, we'll run through the three presentations and then uh, have uh, questions at the end. So over to you, Jean. All right, let me share my screen. Um, oh, all right. Can you see this? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we can. It's it's not okay. at the start, but you need to, yeah. Yeah, there you go. All right, uh, Prakash, uh, thanks for setting this up. This is a, a great uh, uh, platform uh, to discuss the issue of uh, income distribution and capital flows. Uh, this presentation is based on my uh, joint work with Mark Spiegel, who is also at the San Francisco Fed, and Jin Yi Jian at SAFE. Uh, we have a paper on this uh, uh, topic, Capital Controls and Income Inequality. 
Um, so in recent years, there are discussions about the benefit and the cost of uh, uh, capital flows to EMEs, emerging market economies. Um, the uh, trade-off seemed to be that uh, uh, when there's a surge in capital flow, uh, EME might uh, get the benefit because it reduces the financing costs and uh, helps boost investment and production. But uh, oftentimes we see reversals uh, of these flows. It could cause painful sudden stops and even elevate financial risks. So in light of this trade-off, uh, policymakers uh, have uh, uh, their view on capital controls has evolved. Uh, here I quote some, uh, some statement from an IMF study uh, and uh, uh, basically says, uh, occasionally we could consider using capital controls as part of the macro uh, potential policy toolkit to manage flows. And uh, as I said in the beginning, this paper uh, does not discuss the effect on output or investment. Uh, we, we focus on the consequence of uh, capital flows on income distribution. And uh, here's a, a, a chart that might uh, speak to this general issue of the relation between capital flows and uh, income inequality. This chart uh, uh, is taken from an economic letter that uh, Mark and I and uh, uh, Iwan, uh we wrote recently. Uh, so it shows the relation between the average changes in Gini coefficient, which is a measure of income inequality, and the, the average in changes uh, in net private capital inflows uh, as it's not change, it's average share of net private capital inflows in GDP in uh, about 60 emerging market economies over the years from 2001 to 2018. And it shows, uh, suggests some positive relations. Some countries with uh, low or negative uh, net inflows experience a reduction in Gini and some other countries with a high net inflow as a share of GDP experience an increase in Gini. Uh, this is only suggestive, though. So to understand this uh, link between capital count policy or capital flows and income distribution requires uh, a framework that takes into account uh, uh, other frictions because the, the uh, correlation can, uh, can be complicated by other factors like financial frictions. So we pre, uh, we look uh, looked into such a framework where this chart shows uh, the connection, a simplified uh, a version of the model that we consider. We uh, include the two sets of uh, economic agents, households who are savers and workers, and entrepreneurs who are borrowers who also work. And uh, uh, the savers and the, the borrowers are uh, connected through domestic banks. Uh, the bank take deposits from the household and the land to the entrepreneurs. Uh, the households don't know how to invest or produce, the entrepreneurs do. So there's some specialization. And in addition, this is an open economy, small open economy. So the household can save uh, in either domestic banks or they can save in foreign banks. In the latter case, uh, this would represent capital outflow. And uh, similarly, foreign investors uh, can lend to entrepreneurs, not just domestic banks. Foreign investors can also lend to entrepreneurs and the lending from foreign investors would be capital inflows. And the government the policy uh, can impose controls on both inflows and outflows by taxing the returns. Okay, so I'll make those uh, uh, specification uh, uh, concrete through these uh, several slides of equations for those experts. Uh, I, I mean, for general audience, I uh, just try to explain in words what's going on. So here's the uh, one of the agents, one of the two type of agents, household who are savers. Uh, the household lives for two period, young and old. They consume when young and old, C Y is young, C O is the consumption when old. And the, the young generation finance their consumption and the saving by wage income and some bequest from the previous generation, I call it gamma. Uh, 
and uh, uh, consumption, uh, uh, the, the, the saving includes deposit D in domestic banks and the deposit in uh, foreign banks, BF. BF is a capital outflow. Uh, at the old age, uh, the household uh, consumption is financed by the returns on bank deposits, including domestic returns R times D and the foreign deposit returns at the interest rate, world interest rate, our star. How D is a tax on the returns from deposits at foreign banks or capital outflow tax. ZD is just a shock um, to the outflows. A higher ZD represents a higher return on saving in foreign banks. So it encourages capital outflows. And unlike tau D, which distort the steady state, ZD, it does not. It just, uh, on average, is one, but it goes up and down. T is lump sum uh, transfer from the government. Gamma is a bequest to the next generation. You can obtain this no arbitrage condition from the optimizing uh, uh, decisions, which says that there's a wedge between the uh, domestic deposit interest rate R and the world interest rate R star determined by the uh, tax rate on capital outflow, tau D, and the capital outflow shock ZD. For the other agent, entrepreneur, who borrows, invests, and produce, uh, he also lives for two periods, young and old. When an entrepreneur is young, he consumes, purchase capital from the existing old, KO is an amount, QK is Tobin's Q, or price of capital, and he invests I, Subject to investment, uh, subject to adjustment cost, and the, this uh, flow of expenditure is financed by entrepreneur's wage income, plus borrow, uh, borrowing or external debt. The borrowing can be coming from domestic bank or from foreign investors. So B E is a sum of those borrowings, and gamma E is an, again a bequest from the previous generation. When the entrepreneur is old, the consumption is financed by the overall return on capital investment including the after depreciation uh, value of capital and the, the rental uh, rate, RK. And the entrepreneur needs to repay the debt, RL, uh, and then receive a lump sum transfer from the government minus the bequest left to the next generation. The capital stock evolves according to this law of motion. And then, then the intermediary is a bank. The bank takes deposit D from the household and lends the entrepreneur B. And the bank is perfectly competitive. That means they just break even. And there is an intermediation cost, theta uh, times Y, it's normalized by output, which drives a wedge between the lending rate RL and the deposit rate R. The wedge depends on the marginal intermediation cost. And the uh, production of final goods requires a capital accumulated by the entrepreneur and the uh, labor, two types of labor, household labor and entrepreneur labor. Because the workers' are, skills are perfect substitutes in this model, we can abstract from distributional issues of labor income. Uh, labor income is proportional to each other between the two types of agents. We focus on capital income the consequence of capital flow shocks on capital income. And the foreign investors can lend to entrepreneurs. They, entrepreneurs pay them RL, the same interest rate as a domestic bank uh, obtains, but the foreign investor does not get RL. Depending on the uh, inflow tax, tau L, and also the inflow shock, ZL. Uh, the investor's uh, financing cost depends on both the world interest rate R star and the sovereign risk premium. So um, I'll just summarize the model predictions and go to the empirics uh, uh, quickly. And uh, uh, the model predicts uh, that when there's a inflow shock that boosts the return on foreign investment in domestic country, it's going to raise in income inequality or capital income inequality to be more precise. That's because uh, when there's more capital inflows, the entrepreneur would face lower lending rate 
and uh, that the foreign investors comes in to compete with the domestic bank in the lending market. So the lending interest rate will decline. That's going to boost the capital relative price QK or Tobin's Q, and that will raise the capital income for the entrepreneur. However, the shock does not directly affect the deposit interest rate because the deposit interest rate is pinned down by the world interest rate and the capital outflow tax. And therefore, it does not directly affect the capital income for the household. When the entrepreneur income goes up relative to the household, uh, we say the uh, income inequality rises. Now, consider the fact of outflow shock ZD that raises the uh, effective return on foreign deposit for the household. This would reduce inequality because it, it increases the capital in or deposit income for the household, the benefits of the household. The lending rate also increases at the same time because the domestic bank needs to uh, break even. When the deposit rate is uh, higher, the bank has to set a higher lending rate. That's going to depress the Tobin's Q, the price on capital, and hurt the entrepreneur. So that brings income of the entrepreneur closer to, the, to that of the household and it reduces inequality. And the third shock is a net capital inflow shock which is a decline in the world interest rate. Why do I call it a net capital inflow shock? Because a, a lower world interest rate would make it more attractive for foreign investors to invest in this small open economy when their funding cost is lower. So there will be gross inflow increase. At the same time, the household in the small open economy finds it less attractive to deposit in foreign banks because their earning will go down. So there will be less outflow and more inflow, and therefore a declining R star will cause an increase in net inflow. And uh, uh, the, since the deposit interest rate the declines uh, with R star, uh, the household capital income declines. Uh, but at the same time, uh, declining R star will lead to more foreign investors, uh, uh, um, uh, lending uh, to entrepreneurs, the lending rate has to fall, that boosts the capital price, that benefit E. So a net inflow shock raises inequality. So the three things, gross inflow shock and a net inflow shock both raise inequality and an outflow shock reduce inequality. These are all in the short run, but these are shocks, transitory shocks. So we test these model implications using EME data. And uh, uh, we look at uh, a sample of 87 EMEs from 2002 to 2018. And we measure the income distribution by Gini coefficient. Uh, and we use the uh, uh, Lane and the Malesi Freddy measure of capital flows, private capital flows. And uh, we exclude those uh, uh, offshore financial centers because uh, the capital flows to these destinations the eventual destination is unclear uh, where they end up. Um, so here's the baseline empirical specification we look at. On the left hand side, we look at the change, year over year change, we call it GG, growth rate of Gini in the Gini coefficient. On the right hand side, the main variables of interest are these two, private inflows and the private outflows. We include both. Uh, and uh, uh, the private inflow is just a change in national liabilities minus the government borrowing uh, over GDP. And outflow is a change in national assets minus official reserves over GDP. And X is a vector of control variables, uh, say this time fixed effect. And we, we also have a, a specification where we replace two gross flow measures by a net flow, uh, net inflow measure. And of course, the flows are endogenous. We have to uh, instrument them. Uh, what we do is uh, uh, we look at uh, uh, an interaction between the two-year treasury yields with the geographic distance from the New York City, which is the financial center of the United States. There are some studies, like uh, including my co-author, Mark Spiegel and uh, Andy Rose, they have uh, written about this uh, uh, 
distance to the financial center actually is an important factor that determines the capital flows. So there's a correlation between the distance to the financial center with the capital flows, but that distance is fixed. It's hard to imagine that distance is correlated with the Gini. So we think that's the exogeneity uh, uh, condition that's satisfied. And we interacted with two year treasury. So we, uh, 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 that's a shock to the capital flow. When two year treasury yield go down, the inflow will go up. So we have uh, uh, other uh, uh, IVs because we have two variables uh, in the regression. So we use the regional dummies, uh, Asia, Africa, and the West, uh, in West Europe, uh, West hemisphere. And uh, here's the baseline result. Uh, in the interest of time, I have to go through this quickly. Um, the first column and the second column, just focus on this, these are the baseline. Uh, the first column shows the uh, effect of uh, private inflows and private outflows respectively on the changing Gini. An increase in inflow will raise Gini and the increasing outflow will reduce Gini. This is exactly what the theory suggests that, you know, when there's an increase in capital inflow, inequality should rise. When there's an increasing outflow, inequality should fall. And the magnitude is significant both statistically and economically. Uh, what it means is that one standard deviation increase in the private inflow would lead to a Gini growth, a Gini uh, change of 1.4 percentage points. And similarly, one percentage, a one star deviation increase outflow would raise Gini by 1.6 percentage points. Net inflow has a similarly significant coefficient. So finally, I, I would like to mention a few policy implications. In the short run, since inflow increases will raise uh, inequality, so relaxing inflow controls would, uh, you know, uh, lead to more inequality. Um, but relaxing outflow controls, liberalizing outflows, encouraging households to save more abroad would uh, actually reduce inequality. Uh, in the long run, this is not true anymore. We find that in the long run, steady state, the capital price is not, not relevant. In the long run, Tobin's Q is just one. And uh, then the uh, MPK, marginal product capital, is just equal to lending rate. An increase in inflow will lower the lending rate, therefore MPK, lower the return to entrepreneur with no direct effect on capital income for household. So that would reduce inequality, unlike the short run case when capital price increases. And the relaxing outflow controls similarly would reduce inequality as well. So here's a uh, very quick summary of what we have looked at. Uh, in, a, in a small open economy model with financial frictions, uh, capital inflow increases would uh, raise inequality in the short run, and outflow increases would, re would reduce inequality. And this prediction seems to be consistent with the EME data. In the long run, liberalizing either inflow or outflow would reduce inequality. Of course, we didn't look at the fact or implication of capital flows on labor income distribution which would be an interesting and important subject for future studies. That's all. Thanks very much, John. That was great. Um, I already told Joe that there are some questions for Joe in the chat. There's also a question for you, John. Uh, if you can okay. look at it in, in the Q&A, um, you could try to answer it. Um, let me now turn to Asma and Shoka. Over to you, Asma. Thank you, Prakash. Uh, Shuka, if we can put the presentation. All right. Uh, so thanks to all for joining us to this presentation on financial globalization and inequality. Just a brief background. This is uh, a paper that's part of an upcoming book on inclusive growth led by the uh, IMF Institute for Capacity Development. This paper is co-authored with Barry Eichengreen, University of California, Berkeley, uh, 
Balash Chondo from the African Department and Shuka Kuchan from the EBRD, who is with us on the call here and will co present this work. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here is the outline of the presentation. We will start with some stylized facts and then uh, discuss in some level of detail the transmission channels through which financial globalization affects income inequality. We do this essentially by documenting the literature in this area, synthesizing uh, the academic and policy debate. And the aim is to understand and, and the conditions and hopefully ultimately design policies that would enable maximizing the benefits from financial globalization for all. Uh, so to do this, we looked at different types of flows, FDI, non-FDI, private flows, including portfolio equity flows and official flows, um, aid reserves, as well as remittances. Uh, we will after that discuss the case of Mexico, which uh, illustrates uh, various aspects of the nexus uh, between capital flows and inequality, and then conclude with some policy uh, recommendations. Um, all right, so here are a couple of charts showing uh, trends in financial globalization from 1970 to 2015. The chart on the left shows episodes of capital account liberalization across advanced and emerging economies, and those are represented by the bars in the charts. The darker part of the bars point to advanced economies, and the lighter parts point to emerging markets and developing countries. The chart also has uh, three lines, those captured gross uh, foreign assets. The red one refers to uh, emerging economies, the dotted blue to advanced countries, and the black uh, solid line to, that's the global uh, foreign, uh, gross foreign assets. Uh, the key takeaway from this chart uh, is that financial globalization accelerated since uh, the early 1990s, and we can see this from the spike in the bars around that time with the bulk of capital account liberalizations actually taking place during that period in emerging markets and developing countries. This um, um, uh, development was accompanied by a tenfold increase in cross-border investments, which uh, rose globally from 20 to 200 uh, percent during that period that we cover here, and the bulk of the increase was concentrated around those liberalization waves in 1990 and 2000. Now, uh, looking at the composition of flows uh, in the chart on the right, we see uh, that capital flows exhibited variation over time, but uh, they were predominantly debt flows, as we can see from the blue bars, uh, which together with FDI flows that appear in uh, green bars account for about 70% of global external assets on average during this period. Um, from 1990s, uh, portfolio equity flows gained uh, prominence, those appear in gray uh, bars. And more recently, we can see the increasing relative importance of FDI uh, flows. Um, next slide, please. So here we have a couple of charts showing recent trends in remittances. Looking at the chart on the left, we see that globally remittances have been increasing steadily since mid-1990s, reaching close to 1% of global GDP in 2017. The chart on the uh, uh, right, hand, uh, right side shows um, remittances, that remittances constitute a large share of GDP in uh, many countries. We show here 31 countries. And in some countries such as Tonga, Haiti, and South Sudan, they account for more than one third of GDP. Uh, next slide, please. So this chart shows an experiment uh, that compares the evolution of inequality in open versus closed economies, essentially showing the change in the average market Gini index in the 10 years before and the 10 years after capital account liberalization and compares that to countries that remain closed. We find that the increase in financial globalization and in particular in the awake of capital account liberalization episode has been accompanied by rising uh, within country income inequality and this result holds across uh, different country groups. Uh, to be sure here, um, of course, there are other global trends uh, such as skill bias, technological change, and other country-specific factors that have also affected income inequality, and those factors are not controlled for here. 
uh, the, charts all, the chart also doesn't say uh, whether there were actual flows or what direction those flows are, whether they are inflows or outflows. It simply points to the um, opening of capital account, which allows for these possibilities. So this is something we have to keep in mind when we look at this chart. Uh, the key message here is um, that the increase in inequality we can see was much more pronounced in advanced uh, economies. And one possible explanation here is that in advanced economies, liberalization affected the relative bargaining power of companies and workers. This is something I'll come back to later. Um, the threat, and especially if credible, of being able to move production abroad reduces labor uh, bargaining power and the share of income that goes to worker. And these seem to be more um, credible threats that can be made in advanced countries. Uh, now, in emerging markets and developing economies, we see a much more muted effect, and that's because there is it's a bit of a mixed bag there. Um, in some emerging markets, such as in uh, Latin America, they actually experience a decline in inequality following the liberalization episodes that took place in the uh, early 2000s, while in other countries, uh, other emerging markets, like in uh, emerging Europe, inequality increased as they transitioned from uh, central planning to market economy. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we will uh, next talk about the transmission channel and we'll start with FDI in recipient uh, countries. Uh, a first channel uh, that uh, we point here to is uh, uh, in how uh, inward FDI can affect inequality through its impact on growth. Uh, based on the empirical evidence that we surveyed, uh, FDI inflows have the potential to boost growth through several channels, the transfer of technology, know-how, or positive spillovers um, to international trade and human capital accumulation, and so on. But whether this uh, increase in growth would decrease or increase in equality would very much depend on the nature of growth and the extent to which it's inclusive or not. Another channel is through the impact of FDI on the capital and labor mix. And here there are two parts to this mechanism. First, FDI is expected to uh, lead to higher investment and higher uh, capital labor ratio. This is also supported by our back of the envelope calculation, which we show in the chart uh, on the right hand side and on the panel on the right, um, where we can see that the increase in gross capital formation by more than 6% of GDP in countries that reduced restrictions on FDI inflows was around twice the increase in countries that maintained restrictions during that period. And the second part of this mechanism is that the higher capital labor ratio uh, would tend to increase labor income share. Essentially, what happens is that as foreign and domestic capital compete for workers, there will be upward pressure on wages. And as long as the ownership of capital is concentrated in the hands of high income individual, individuals, this mechanism would tend to reduce inequality. Um, FDI might also affect the relative demand for skills. So if capital substitutes for unskilled labor or complements skilled labor, FDI inflows will increase the relative demand for skills. And this would increase the, the skilled premium and therefore relative, uh, and obviously that would be uh, uh, lead to uh, an increase in inequality. An example that is um, that I would like to quote here is the outsourcing of skill intensive uh, activities by German and Austrian firms uh, to Central and Eastern European countries in the 1990s, which was found to have raised the skill premium in those uh, recipient countries. So putting it together, the emerging picture here suggests that there is positive relationship between inward FDI and inequality. And that's what we also find from the empirical literature that we reviewed, um, despite differences across studies in terms of methodology, measure of measures of inequality, and or the sample coverage in terms of countries or period, the majority of the evidence does point to a positive relationship between inward FDI and inequality. And this is also shown in our calculation here in the chart for on the left side of the. Um, next slide. 
All right, so uh, next is so we talk about the source countries. So here, one potential channel is uh, also the capital labor mix with lower capital labor ratio leading to lower labor income share, and that would tend to ra raise inequality. The scatter plot on the right hand side suggests uh, that in advanced economy, there is potentially negative relationship between outward FDI and the labor income share. Now, the decline in labor income share, as I mentioned before, can take place even without actual capital flows um, taking place. And this takes us to the second channel, which is the bargaining power of labor. Um, so, as I mentioned before, the threat of being able to relocate production abroad could lower this bargaining power, and that would reduce the labor income share and tend to increase inequality. The third channel uh, here is uh, the relative demand for skills, uh, also in source countries. An example is the outsourcing of manufacturing production to the Central and Eastern European countries from Germany, which was found to have led to a decline in the relative demand for manual workers in manufacturing in Germany during the 1990s. There is also similar empirical evidence on outsourcing from the US to Mexico, in the 1990s, and this is something we will take up uh, also later. Um, a, a final channel here is that FDI can facilitate tax avoidance by multinational companies. Tax avoidance will likely raise returns for capital owners and potentially increase um, inequality. Putting it together, the overall impact seems quite straightforward. Uh, most channels suggest an inequality increasing effect of FDI, so it's not surprising that the empirical evidence also documents this positive association between FDI and inequality in source countries. Next slide. Uh, now, the relative strength of all these channels and therefore the overall distributional impact of FDI depends on several factors. Uh, first, the sectoral distribution of FDI, uh, it does play an important role, FDI flowing into uh, low-skilled labor-intensive sectors and activities such as manufacturing assembly would tend to reduce inequality, whereas FDI into capital and skill-intensive sectors such as telecommunication would raise it. Uh, country uh, characteristics such as the level of uh, economic development uh, and the educational attainment of the population in the recipient country also play an important role. And uh, essentially, a high supply of skilled labor could mit mitigate the impact of FDI on uh, the relative demand for skills. Here, I would like to point to the chart on the right side. Our back of the envelope calculation again shows two groups of emerging markets and developing economies, one with increasing inequality and the other with decreasing inequality. The blue bars show the initial educational attainment uh, or educational level, and the red dots show the change in inward FDI. What we see here is that uh, in countries where inequality decreased, uh, not only they had higher edu initial educational level uh, to start with, but they also attracted uh, higher FDI. So this points to the importance of skills and education when it comes to FDI. Um, finally, the labor mobility and competitiveness gains uh, could also affect the distributional effects of FDI. Uh, for example, competitiveness gains from um, outsourcing could help protect employment, especially for the low skilled in source countries, therefore could have a favorable effect on inequality. Uh, some studies actually find empirical evidence that uh, the outsourcing of skill intensive activities by German and Austrian firms to the Central and Eastern European countries resulted in these firms saving some 65 to 80 percent of labor costs and that helped them stay competitive and protecting their workers from losing their jobs. Uh, the reallocation of resources across sectors uh, uh, therefore could mitigate the distributional effects in the long term. Uh, workers can get additional education and training, new generations enter the labor force. So this means that the increase in relative demand for skilled workers could be offset by an increase in the supply of skilled, uh, skilled labor over time. And this could help mitigate the potential inequality increasing effect of FDI. <clears throat> 
And uh, with this, I'll stop here. I'm gonna hand it over to Shuka. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and especially to see so many familiar faces in the audience, at least virtually. Uh, let me turn to non FDI private capital flows or portfolio debt equity as well as other investments, um, such as bank funding and trade credit and look at the impacts of these on inequality through various transmission channels. As Asma mentioned, um, one of the channels through which um, these could affect inequality are, of course, through growth, and this could both increase or reduce inequality depending on how inclusive growth is. However, unlike with FDI, where the literature um, is pretty conclusive in terms of positive effects of FDI and flows on growth, here the empirical ev evidence is somewhat more mixed. Um, but perhaps even more important than the effects of these non FDI private capital flows on the level of growth is their effects on the volatility of growth. Um, these capital flows tend to amplify the business cycles, increase volatility, um, which often disproportionately hurts the poor. This is especially the case if this leads to crises, much has been said about the disproportionate burden of the global financial crisis, or these days the COVID-19 pandemic being borne by those with lower levels of education or lower levels of income before the pandemic. And as you can see on the bar chart on the right here, um, indeed, inequality increased much more sharply in countries that experienced capital account liberalization, where these liberalization episodes were followed by a crisis. However, capital flows could also help financial inclusion, and if these um, help manage income shocks, then they could be pro-poor and help protect um, against falling into poverty and could help reduce inequality. The these capital flows could also have an impact on inequality through their effects on asset prices. And here the impact depends very much on the prices of which assets are affected and who holds these. So inequality could increase um, if this results in an increase in the prices of assets that are primarily held by richer households, such as equity, um, theoretically, and could also reduce inequality if it increases the prices of physical assets, for instance, housing, which tends to account for a larger share of the wealth of poorer households. To the extent that these capital flows help ease fiscal constraints, then the surplus, the gains that are generated, um, could also be used um, for redistributive policies that could lean against um, their impact on rising inequality. Um, Asma talked earlier about the effects of FDI inflows on tax avoidance. So similarly here, we can mention um, tax evasion and illicit financial flows. So well, here we are talking about illegal flows, their distributional impact would be very similar as what Asma discussed for the FDI flows. We would expect this to increase the returns to the owners of capital and hence to result in an increase in inequality. However, as with FDI flows, the effects of these flows on inequality will depend very much on country circumstances as well as on the composition of flows. So benefits tend to be larger in countries with well-developed institutions. In contrast, financial globalization could amplify pre-existing weaknesses and the financial system could exacerbate underlying distortions. With exchange rates, um, the results could be theoretically ambiguous and that floating exchange rates could act as a buffer that help mitigate the growth volatility that would be particularly harmful to the poor. However, if floating exchange rates come at the cost of less well anchored inflation expectations, then in turn, this would create a disproportionate burden on poorer households. Again, the composition of flows matters, and here again, this is focused on the volatility and crisis angle, where the risk of crises might be lower in the case of portfolio equity than in the case of portfolio debt flows. Let me turn um, now to official flows and their possible effects on inequality. Official development assistance is generally found to increase growth, and it's generally found to be pro-poor including uh, among other channels because it reduces income volatility. 
However, as we saw for other types of flows, benefits tend to be greatest in countries with higher quality of institutions, as these can help reach those most in need. Um, finally, looking at international reserves, here their effects on inequality are far from obvious. So, as many emerging markets accumulated large reserves in the period before the global financial crisis, this is a low interest rate environment in which search for, search for yield behavior increased the prices of riskier assets, which, as I mentioned earlier, are typically held um, by higher income households. So, here we would expect this to result in an increase in inequality. Um, but international reserve accumulation um, that aims to keep the currency undervalued would also have distributional implications both across countries, but also within countries. Within countries, we would expect this to result in a redistribution from consumers towards those um, owners of capital and exporting industries who benefit from this undervalued currency. Finally, um, let me turn to a slightly different kind of capital flow here and look at the effects of remittances on inequality. Here, early studies um, have typically looked at income distribution simply with and without remittances. Some of the more recent literature aimed to construct counterfactual income distributions. So looking at what otherwise um, remittance receiving households income would be in the absence of remittances. But if we allowed these households to respond, for instance, by starting to work or increasing their existing hours um, to make up for this lost income that they would otherwise receive in remittances. However, even employing very similar methodologies, we still see mixed findings in the literature. Some studies see that remittances increase inequality, others that they reduce them or have no significant effect. But these seemingly contradictory findings could be reconciled by changing effects over time. The idea here is that initially there are very high fixed costs of migration. So the first pioneer migrants tend to be from wealthier households. So the households receiving remittances also tend to be already wet or off. So initially migration and remittance receipts could be expected to increase inequality. However, as migration has a longer history, migration opportunities become more widespread. Almost everyone knows someone who has migrated. We would expect migrants to also be able to come from poorer households. Um, so here we would expect remittances to be able to lower inequality. Um, and some papers have indeed documented these patterns in cross-country framework where migrants tend to come from poorer household and countries with longer migration histories and hence lower fixed costs of migration than in countries where migration is still prohibitively expensive uh, for some parts of the income distribution. So with that, um, we come to the end of the possible transmission channels, um, but we'll try to illustrate this whole and make it a bit more concrete with the case study of Mexico. Now, Mexico is an interesting case study um, in this respect because it's a country of inequality and has very high levels of inequality compared to other OECD economies. It's also a country that has seen rapid external integration um, through NAFTA, GATT. Um, it's also an important receiver of remittances. So the chart on the left uh, shows the evolution of inequality measured here using the Gini coefficient from the 1970s onwards. And you can see the first period of the 1970s, these are the years of rapid growth, state-led industrialization, and very much a model of shared development. And you can see a significant drop in inequality, though from initially very high levels. However, this period is also accompanied by a buildup in debt, and then as external financing conditions tighten, the oil price drops, this ends um, with a debt crisis. Then, as Mexico regains access uh, to international markets and FDI flows start to increase, this period in the 80s and early 90s is characterized by large FDI inflows, um, primarily due to the outsourcing of activities from the U.S., However, here, this is still increasing inequality because it increases the relative demand for skilled labor, increasing the skill premium, increasing wages at the top of the income distribution, and hence inequality. 
Again, this period um, ends with a crisis. However, um, since then, we largely see a decline in inequality. And here, um, inequality is decreasing because uh, the composition of FDI flows is shifting. There is now increasing relative demand for unskilled labor, largely due to the assembly activities that are being outsourced. And also, and this is in line with what Asma mentioned earlier, because there is a relative increase in the average skill level of the Mexican population in the meantime, so that gains can be more broadly shared. The scatter shows here that indeed um, there was a larger fall in inequality in the states closer to the U.S. border that received larger FDI inflows in the form of the outsourcing of these assembly activities. Turning now to the effect of remittances, um, these tend to be pro-poor in Mexico and they tend to become more pro-poor over time. Um, in the sense that remittance receiving households are on average poorer than those households that do not receive remittances. And this is true even if we take um, remitted amounts into account. The bar chart on the right looks at what inequality would be like in the absence of remittances. So the first bar shows the Gini coefficient computed from individual level data if we take the income distribution as is, so including remittance receipts for households that receive remittances. The second bar creates a rather naive counterfactual in that for remittance receiving households, we simply take out received amounts in terms of remittances. The bar on the right um, takes a slightly more sophisticated approach in that it allows for behavioral responses on behalf of receiving households where they're allowed to increase their hours, start working or respond otherwise to this loss of income that they would otherwise have received in terms of remittances. However, um, whether you compare the second or third bar to the first one, you can see that inequality would generally be higher in the absence of remittances. And this is true even if we allow for behavioral responses. The two bar charts at the bottom, the yellow gray ones, look at what happens to remittances during the peso crisis and the global financial crisis. And these plot the likelihood of receiving remittances and remittance receipts as a share of households income by the income decile of the remittance receiving household. And they show the effects um, during the crisis years relative to the years before and after the crisis. You can see that for both crises, likelihood of receiving remittances falls at the top during the crisis, and this is consistent with falling investment motives. Um, during the PISA crisis, you don't see much significant movement at the bottom of the distribution yet. However, what is quite striking is this increase um, in the likelihood of receiving remittances for the poorest deciles during the global financial crisis. So this would be consistent with migration opportunities by then being more widely available so that there would be poor households receiving remittances. Migrants would also likely be better integrated into the US labor market by then. But nonetheless, it is striking because the increase in likelihood of receiving an increase in remitted amounts occurs in a context where both the host and the home country were hit by a shock at the same time. So finally, um, let me conclude um, with some suggestions of policies that could be used to weigh against the inequality increasing effects of capital flows. So we talked a lot uh, about possible effects through growth volatility and crises. So here, alongside fiscal and monetary policies, capital flow management measures could be part of the broader package to help manage the risks from large and volatile capital flows that could create this growth volatility that is especially harmful for the poor. Um, Asma mentioned this, um, and it was also very visible from the Mexico example that the average educational attainment of the population is important for ensuring um, that gains from inflows can be widely shared. Um, smoothing and facilitating reallocation across sectors is also important as um, capital flows are often concentrated in particular sectors, particular regions, while there are others that are left behind. Um, so here, enhanced labor market flexibility and other policies that help reallocation across sectors can maximize the gains from these flows.
In general, uh, market-friendly product market um, policies can help make countries more attractive as FDI destinations. But um, perhaps even more importantly, investment promotion agencies would be a relatively inexpensive tool that can help attract high quality capital flows. Um, and by high quality, we mean those that are a good match to the country's skill base and at a technological level, um, level of technological development that can maximize spillovers to the domestic economy. Now, so far, the bar charts we showed you in terms of increases in equality um, after capital account liberalization episodes all looked at Ginny's based on market income. Um, the chart on the right here highlights that indeed the increases in market income were considerably larger than when we look at the increase in inequality based on disposable income, suggesting that redistribution can play an important role in mitigating the adverse distributional consequences of capital account liberalization. And then finally, and this is very much in line with the general macro policies I started off with, financial sector policies such as macroprudential policies can help smooth the business cycle. And then finally, in line with the pro-poor nature of remittances, policies that help lower the cost of remittances, in particular in corridors where these are still relatively high, can maximize the gains of these um, on both sending and receiving sites and help lower inequality. Um, let me stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Asma and Shoka. Um, we have a few minutes for uh, uh, just answering some questions and, and, and winding up. Uh, let me first invite uh, Xiang Li and Dan Su. Uh, they have also done some work in this area. So if, if you would like to perhaps summarize some of your own work and, and react to what you have heard or if you have any questions for any of the presenters. Over to you, Shen. Thank you so much, Prakash, uh, for the nice gesture. So actually, we also have a related literature also studying on the impact of capital account liberalization on the income inequality. So we also look at the countries before and after they liberalize the capital account, but we also did a matching exercise by match the country that are liberalized and those countries who keep their capital account controlled. And we look at, uh, in addition to the co Gini coefficient, we also look at income share of those top 50, uh, top 10 percent, middle 40 percent, and the lower uh, half. So uh, our overall conclusion is similar to yours, and we find that opening capital account is associated with an increase in the income share of the rich and a reduction in the income share of the uh, poor. So the income inequality goes up. But if we emphasize the impact on the FDI liberalization, uh, the result is not so significant compared to the liberalization of the portfolio capital flows. So, so actually, uh, so our findings are very consistent with yours, but actually I have learned more than I can contribute. So uh, I have actually have one question written in the chat for Joe. Uh, but also, I think my overall or broader question is how would this uh, capital account liberalization impact the cross country uh, impact on the, especially on the advanced economies and the emerging economies? How will their country or cross country inequality be affected? If you have any thoughts, I'd be very happy to hear. Thank you very much. So I believe that was for me. Yeah, uh, let me just add a few thoughts of my own and then uh, give each of the panelists uh, about five uh, five minutes or so if they want to use it to, to, to wrap up. Um, my questions were sort of very general, but um, in a sense, I, I, I don't get a good sense of how quantitatively important these impacts are on inequality. Are they sort of really big enough relative to the benefits that countries get from these flows that we should worry about it? Or are these kind of second order effects that we are talking about and not worth worrying about? As I, as I said, when, when we had the board meeting, uh, some directors were keen to understand uh, these distributional implications, but others felt this was you know, perhaps not worth the effort given that these effects may, may be small. So. Uh, I, I get a sense of the direction of the effects that you folks are talking about, but don't have a good sense of the magnitude of, of, of this impact. Um, the other question I had, just also looking at some of the questions coming through the chat is, 
whether we should kind of be a little less fond of FDI than, than, than we are. We tend to place FDI fairly high in the pecking order because, you know, as Asma's slides showed, it's a relatively stable flow. We think it brings lots of benefits like technology transfer and so on. But um, many of you also cited this uh, work that was actually done at the IMF that uh, says that 40% of FDI is kind of phantom FDI. Um, so combining that point with the distributional impacts that you folks are finding, uh, I'm just wondering, if, if, should we be revising our views about FDI to be a little less fond of it or, or you think that's going too far? And then uh, for Zheng, I also had a question about, you know, your, your, your model emphasizes the difference between short run and long run effects. Uh, the short run effects are to increase inequality, but the long run effects are in, in the other direction. You have 20 years of data. I wonder if that is long enough for you to tease out uh, this distinction between the short run and the long run effects. Also, if there are some country examples where uh, initially when they opened up inequality increased, but over time with market development and other factors, inequality actually fell. Are you aware of sort of examples of countries that have gone through this sort of transition? So um, with that, let me turn it over to each of the panelists. We'll go in the order that they presented. There are a number of questions in the chat as well. If you had a chance to look at them and respond to some of them, that would be great as well. So um, it's 2.17, we should end at 2.25. So let me, we have roughly four or five minutes for each panelist. So let me start with you, Joe. Sure. So I am going to answer, but I regret I don't have half an hour to answer because some of the questions are very rich in terms of the implications they're raising. So perhaps, Shang Li, I could start with your some of your comments in the chat, as well as Prakash, yours. I certainly don't hope that my results are indicating that I think FDI is bad for the source country. I, I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply saying that there is this implication, though, that there's an impact upon the income distribution, which in a sense shouldn't be a surprise given the general distribution of profits and how the impact on income distribution in those countries. So I think, Prakash, the answer would be not in a sense to make a case against FDI, but to make a case simply for progressive income tax rates and maybe for a wealth tax, that if my results are being generated by the wealth holdings of the upper one or 10%, their holding of stock, that a wealth tax would in a sense help alleviate that. And that might be a better answer. Um, strongly, you asked a little bit about the impact on the host countries that are receiving the FDI, of course, and that's, of course, an important point. What I got from Osma's nice literature survey, though, was that there's a little bit of disagreement about the impact of FDI inflows themselves, that you see kind of people talk about different things. For example, I have a paper right in front of me from the IMF review of 2013, that I'm sure many of you know, by Jomot Lal and Pap Gaju that make a case that FDI actually hurts because of the increase in the skill premium for domestic workers. So I hear different things and I don't have any done any work on that myself. So I'm a little bit of an agnostic. I will tell you though, you may be interested to know that there actually is a paper done by a fellow at Wesleyan University um, that looks at FDI out income outflows, the phenomenon I'm talking about, but as outflows from four East European countries. And how do you assess output and welfare within those countries when the money is leaving the country? And he has some interesting results with the general equilibrium model. So that might be an interesting way to go. But John Lee, I'll tell you what else I was thinking of as I was thinking about your nice question. I was thinking about Milovankovic's elephant curve. And I was thinking what I'm showing is that, yeah, the people at the upper, upper part of the income distributions always do well. And what I'm saying is they do well in a global economy because they own assets outside their own econ economy that make money. And other people who might do well, as your point, people in those countries that get the FDI who then respond and have growth in productivity, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the middle part of the global middle class. And of course, the ones who don't do as well are those in between them, those in the middle lower class and the advanced economies. So in that sense, I think what I'm saying is consistent with that type of analysis. And the last one I'll make is I think, going back again to the nice survey literature, what would be fun to do to compare my results with those on remittances. Because again, they're both factor payments that go across borders. In the case of remittances, it looks like they actually lower inequality by helping the poorest members of society, if I understood the literature correctly. And I'm saying, yeah, but with capital income, it's seen the opposite, it's increasing inequality. So that's kind of an interesting difference 
in terms of the phenomenon of international factor payments and how they affect the host countries. Okay, so that's an answer to some of the questions you raised, and I'd be happy to have a further conversation with you. Sean Craig asked a really neat question about taxes and tax treaties, and I don't have time to really think about it through. Kind of depends on what we're talking about, Sean. If the fact that because of tax arbitration, some of US foreign income seems to come from Luxembourg as opposed to some other country, I don't think that changes my results very much. If on the other hand, it means that the income figures are bigger than they otherwise would have been net of income tax, that certainly is true. But I did try to make the point, this is not just a US issue, it affects multinational base in other countries as well. So even if we shrank the total amount of FDI income to represent some of these things that these countries do, I still think the relative distribution of countries will look pretty similar. Um, at least that's my, that's my thought about it, okay? So those are my, my very fast answers to some very good questions. Thanks, Joe, that was great. Uh, let me turn it over to you, Shen. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Prakash. Uh, that's a good question. And also for the other panelists for stimulating discussions. Uh, to answer your question, Prakash, you asked about the short run versus long run. Uh, we did try the, you know, to do the uh, long run regression, but unfortunately our data is too noisy to detect a significant impact. Uh, you know, the theory is pretty clear, uh, and the theory is a very uh, narrowly focused on capital income distribution. We don't really say much about labor income. Uh, and uh, uh, from the uh, other panelists, it, it seems uh, to be clear that uh, labor income distribution is certainly an important factor to consider, especially in the long run, when you have more capital inflows uh, this uh, increase in capital stock would actually increase the marginal productivity of labor and raise the wages. And uh, that might, uh, you know, reduce inequality. Uh, and of course, the uh, reality is more nuanced. You could have skilled labor, unskilled labor who benefit more or less. But uh, one uh, example that, uh, uh, that is suggestive is uh, what uh, uh, Tsoka uh, and Asma pre uh, presented about Mexico. Mexico's Gini actually declined after NAFTA uh, when the US FDI increased. Uh, and uh, this, this is uh, actually uh, uh, promising because uh, it says, suggests that uh, you don't want to, uh, you want to be very careful in designing policies in response to this uh, financial globalization. Do you, you know, one option you might consider is to control the it, it strengthen the control over the capital flows uh that's going to probably uh, uh kill the uh kitchen uh, uh ch chicken for the, you know uh, uh that lays golden egg uh and the other uh, option is uh, to as joe is suggesting to you know uh, change your domestic policy for redistribution progressive taxation is one one way to go uh and uh, there are also the financial sector reforms uh, in the domestic economy you want, you want to consider. So the, in the long run, these issues are intricate and uh, the model is uh, just a laboratory that suggests that, uh, you know, there are some uh, relations uh, between uh, long run uh, effect uh, of capital flows and income inequality, but the data uh, is, hasn't really uh, borne that out. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Asma and Shoka, over to you for the last minute or two. All right, so I think in response to your question, Prakash, about the size, um, so that I think it depends on, it varies from uh, one country to another. And what we found is it pretty much depends on the institutional setup and frame policy framework and so on. So the expectation is that those are more acute in countries where those institutions are weaker or the financial sector is not as deep and so on and uh, and uh, obviously with the education also being an important factor uh, here so i think it's it's really about thinking you know that opening the capital capital account yes it does uh, bring all these benefits in terms of the growth but it needs to be kind of preceded and or complemented with reforms that 
that kind of strengthen the institutional framework that boosts the skills and uh, the other things that uh, policy recommendations that we spoke about uh, that Shuka mentioned. Um, there is obviously a role for uh, redistributive policies, so that can definitely be part of the package uh, and so on. And I think the as opposed to like saying maybe whether it's too big or too small, what seems to come out that there is some sort of um, um, adverse effect on inequality. So in that sen sense, that's what is established, then it's hard to maybe ignore that. And uh, even with the benefits that come with uh, opening the capital account, it's only good to kind of complement that with all these other policies that can broaden sharing the benefits of financial globalization. I think that's my uh, comment. Yeah. Shoka, you have the last word. Um, maybe just to add a little bit on the question on whether we're too enthusiastic about FDI and Phantom FDI specifically. So Phantom FDI, as we mentioned, would likely increase inequality in the sending country because it benefits the owners of capital there, would likely have more limited effects in the receiving country. Um, but speaking of effects in the receiving country, I think what is most striking, both from our analysis here and from some analysis that we've been doing at EBRD, using project level FDI inflows, as well as actually how much heterogeneity is. Um, so not just at the level of country characteristics in terms of the effects being influenced by countries' institutions and education, but also the type of FDI flow that is being attracted in terms of sectors, providing a good skill match, a good uh, match with the level of technological development. Um, and here, I think one of the interesting areas is in terms of services, which um, FDI flows have been shifting towards, but typically have more limited spillovers to the domestic economy. So to the extent that investment promotion agencies or other policies can help attract FDI flows in sectors and specifically in service sectors that have more spillovers or so closer linkages with manufacturing, whether that's, for instance, logistics or financial services, um, this would increase their benefits. So. A um, lot of role for policy to influence the aggregate effects of FDI on inequality. Okay, great. Um, my thanks to all the all the presenters. I think these were clear and ex excellent presentations. And um, I noticed that uh, there there were quite a few uh, people from our uh, executive director's offices. So uh, you've certainly given. Them, uh, a lot to think about and um, so so thank you again and um, let's let's stay in touch i think we formed a community of people who are interested in the distributional implications of the capital flows so let's let's stay in touch okay thank you all very much bye bye yeah, bye thank you thank you Thank you.